every couple of months, we will take a break from our regular teaching series, and I'm going to preach on a difficult question or a difficult passage specifically requested by you as members of the congregation, all right? And that, this is an opportunity for me as your pastor to address a topic of specific interest or specific relevance to you that I, might not otherwise be on the preaching schedule in the near future. And it's also a, an opportunity for you as the congregation to try to stump the pastor, all right, to see if you can give me a difficult question and whether or not I can come back with a clear biblical answer. So we're, you know, we're trying to have some fun uh, with this a little bit. And a number of you did submit questions, and they were all very good questions, by the way. Uh, I had about half a dozen, I think. And unfortunately, of course, I can, I can only deal with one question at a time. So the idea wasn't to you know, try to do a little tiny sermonette on every single one, uh, but to take each one and really look at it. And so if I didn't pick yours this morning, please don't be angry with me. You know, I still like you. You know, will you still like me back? Be patient. I'll get around to your question uh, eventually. So every couple of months we're gonna do one of these. Now, if, you, if your question is a question that you're really struggling with, it's, if it's really pressing on you and you feel like you're having a hard time with it in regards to your faith and your Christian walk, then you, I would suggest just come talk to me. Let's meet and let's work through that. Let's not wait for uh, maybe a few months down the road for me to get to that question. Now, I received two questions out of the half dozen that I got that were very similar in nature, and the best way to sum them both up is to ask this question, and that is, what happens when we die? I mean, what, what happens when we die? I mean, this is, a, this is a very interesting question indeed. I don't know how much time you've ever thought, uh, taken, sorry, thinking about this, or how much reading up or, or Bible study you've ever done, but this is a, something in which the Bible does have uh, quite a bit to say, actually, although it may have some different things to say than we tend to think. And um, so that's why I said in my, my sermon preview blog on the Facebook page, I may in fact actually stump some of you this morning. So, ha, ha, ha. Uh, let's read the scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm going to ask you to stand once again as we do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we are going to read verses 13 to 18. It's on the screen. It's on your handout. Hear the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would speak through your servant now. Lord, I, th I thank you for what you have shown me this week and, and what I feel led to share and what I've prepared. But Lord, ultimately, we need to hear from you. And so I just pray that your spirit would guide and direct me as I, as I share and that our hearts would be open to receive the truth of the gospel, this great hope that we have. Holy Spirit, lead us, indeed, into this great truth. And as your word promises, may the truth set us free. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so 
Let's look at this passage with three headings this morning. We're back to three. You know, I got you so used to four, four things or three things and a fourth. Now I'm going back to three. I'm really playing with you this morning, eh? Really. Uh, three things. Let's look at death and popular belief. Let's look at death and Christian hope. And let's look at death and our response, okay? Death and popular belief, death and Christian hope, death and our response. Now, Paul was writing to people who lived in a culture that had very different perspectives on death and life after death than what Christianity was claiming and teaching. And that's why he writes uh, and says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Paul wanted his readers to be clear about what the Bible taught about death and life after death. And there were many views um, in the ancient world, of course, of death and, and what happens when we die, but we want to focus on two popular views amongst the Greeks because the Christians in Thessalonica, who Paul was writing to, were Greeks, and they were very influenced by the, the Greek culture of their day. The first popular view of death in Greek culture was what's called the Epicurean view. Now this view claimed that this life is all there is. There was nothing beyond the grave. There was nothing beyond the grave, nothing after death, um, just emptiness. And this was based on a, a Greek philosopher named Epicurus who taught that we don't experience death the same way that we experience life. Because you and I experience life through our senses, you know, through sight and through taste and touch and sound, and because we experience life that way, when we die, all those senses cease to function, right? So he actually claimed, he says, you know what, we don't actually really experience death because everything that we experience life with, our senses shut down and, and cease, and so that's it. You just cease to exist. And because of that, there was no reason to fear death because you didn't, you didn't feel anything. You, know, you didn't experience anything. It's just, that was just the end of it. And when others die, the Epicurean view said, you, know, you should just celebrate the lives of your loved ones and your friends instead of mourning their demise. And a popular epitaph that was written on Greek and Roman tombstones in those days was this, this saying, I was not, I am, I am not, I don't care. How encouraging, eh? How'd you like that on your tombstone? I was not, I am, I am not, I don't care. And it was so popular, actually, that it, it was reduced to just the initials of the Latin or Greek letters, right, of, of the words, of all those words. So you could walk by a tombstone and you could just see the initials of those, uh, of those words in Greek and you would know exactly what it meant. And that was very popular, you know? It was very, very popular. Um, it, it would almost kind of be like the equivalent today of walking past this tombstone and just seeing this no, no regrets, Right? It's, um, we'll get back to that. Now, many believed in the Greek culture, according to this Epicurean view, that there was really only one way for true immortality, and that was fame. That was fame. And this is depicted very clearly in the epic Hollywood film Troy. I'm not sure if you've ever seen Troy, but in Troy, it's a film about this great Greek war that happened, and Achilles, who's the Greek hero, who's played by Brad Pitt, gets talked into going to war because of the possibility of etching his name in the annals of history as the greatest warrior ever. And that's really what, what gets Achilles to the war, is the possibility that because he's this amazing warrior, you know, the guy who's the general who's trying to talk him into going to war says, Achilles, this is going to be the greatest war ever. And Achilles goes because the only way to live forever was to have your name remembered. So that's the Epicurean view. Now, 
The other popular view of death was what's known as the Gnostic view. And the Gnosticism taught that matter, the, the physical world, matter, was evil, but the soul, the spiritual, was good. The spiritual was good, the soul was good, and the, uh, the body essentially was a prison for the soul. And death frees the soul. You know, death's good because it frees your soul from, from uh, the reality of this world, and then you go on to experience, you know, this disembodied bliss in a truly perfected, you know, spiritual reality, basically a form of heaven. And Gnosticism glorified death as the, a welcome rescue from this life. So those are the two ancient views that, that Paul, of the culture Paul was writing into. Now, what's amazing though, is that our two, modern, our two most popular modern views of death are strikingly similar. If you haven't already started to pick up on them, let me give them to you. Here's the first one. The first one's the secular view. Now, secularism claims that this earthly life is all there is. That's it. So we should enjoy life. You know, and the very popular phrase amongst secular people is YOLO. You only live once right? You're only, you only go around once, right? So while you're here, you might as well enjoy life. You, you, know, you might as well um, pursue your own truth and happiness, and you might as well live with, with no regrets. And there's no mention at a secular funeral of anything that comes after. Um, usually the focus of a secular funeral is to celebrate the person's life. You know, you celebrate what they contributed. Now, doesn't this sound strikingly like Epicurean view? You know, there's nothing after life. Enjoy life while you're here. Now, the other popular view in our culture, which I think is the more dominant view, the, the, the most popular, is what I've called, and I don't know if I really, I couldn't think of anything better to call it, is the sentimental view, all right? Now, this view claims that every person has a soul, and when people who have lived a good life die, their souls go to heaven and they live forever in some form of, uh, you know, a disembodied bliss with family and friends and everybody gets reunited and it's all wonderful and peaceful and happy. And it's all warm fuzzies and hugs and, uh, and because there is no heaven, you know, you ought to live a good life because then you can go there one day when you die. And this, this view is strikingly similar to the Gnostic view, right? That really what, what's most important is the soul and, you know, but, and when you die, it's all about where your soul goes. Now, some of you are thinking, hold on a second. Isn't that basically what the Bible teaches? Doesn't the Bible teach you live a good life, you know, you give God a good moral record and your reward for living a good life is that one day you will die and your soul will float off to heaven. Oh my goodness, no. <laughs> that is not, it's not even close to what the Bible's teaching. So, <laughs> what does the Bible teach? What's the Christian hope? Well, stay, stick with me on this because we're, we're, we're gonna hit the gas here, all right? The Christian hope doesn't teach nothingness after death and it doesn't teach, it doesn't glorify death. It doesn't sentimentalize death. The Christian answer to death is resurrection. Paul says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now what's very interesting is that term, Jesus died and rose again, Paul, when he talks usually about the death and resurrection of Jesus, doesn't frame it that way. This is framed like a statement of belief. It's a creedal statement. It's a type of statement that Christians would have said as a creed. He's reminding them of a core belief of Christianity, that Jesus Christ died and rose again. Easter is the Christian hope. The resurrection of Jesus, friends, it's what all of our hopes hang on. All of them hang on the resurrection of Jesus because the resurrection of Jesus is a signpost of everything that God is going to do 
at the end of human history, for every person who trusts in him, and for the entire created order. Are you with me? <laughs> Appreciate the honesty, Brian. Never lose that honesty. What God, here's another way to put it. What God did for Jesus at the end of human history, he's gonna do for every single person who trusts him and, e and everything in creation. It's resurrection. Commentator Beverly Roberts Gaventa puts it perfectly. This is what she says. She says, Jesus' resurrection, it's not an isolated event, a single rabbit God pulls out of the hat to demonstrate that Jesus is in fact the Christ. The resurrection is directly connected with these two things, don't miss it, God's final triumph and with the lives of all human beings. Simply put, she's saying the resurrection's not a magic trick. You know, it's, it's not uh, God's way of saying in Jesus, I told you so. <laughs> you know, I told you I was God. The resurrection of Jesus is God's glorious triumph over three things that I want us to look at right now, and that is the effects of sin, the reality of death, and the experience or problem of exile. Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the effects of sin. Number one, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the effects, all the effects of human sin are being reversed, are being undone. The reason the second coming of Jesus is so glorious, the reason what, is that this world is gonna be completely transformed and completely restored back to its original rightful state and design. That's what's gonna happen. And Paul depicts this in Romans 8, verses 19 and 23, which Joe read as one of the three scriptures. He says, for the creation waits, listen, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. Get this, the redemption of our bodies. Now God created human beings to faithfully rule over all of creation. We looked at this a number of weeks ago when we looked at Hebrews chapter two. But when we sinned, everything was affected. Everything was affected. I don't know if I have another, no, I don't. Everything was affected. A curse came over every created thing. A curse came over every created thing. Sickness and death entered into the world. Weeds and thorns sprung up out of the ground Humans and animals now lived in fear of each other. There's a spot, actually. It's this really kind of, you know, it's this really interesting spot that's easy to miss when God's talking to Noah after the flood and he says, listen, animals are now gonna live in fear of you. And he's based, that's an effect of our sin. And when we're revealed, here, here's what's going on. Paul says, Creation's in bondage to decay. All of creation is groaning for the day when God will perfectly and finally redeem us and clothe us as his image bearers in our new resurrected bodies. And when we're revealed as the true, glorified, perfected children of God, on that day, creation will finally have the faithful, Christ-like rulers and stewards it was always supposed to have. That's why creation's groaning. That's why creation's saying, can we just get to that day <laughs> when everything goes back to the way it was supposed to be? The curse on creation will be broken and will actually start to work backwards. No more let sorrow grow, sorry, no more let sorrow grow and sin 
infest the ground. Sorry, no more let sin and sorrow grow and thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. We're gonna sing it in a couple weeks. Joy to the world. So, Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the effects of sin, but Jesus' resurrection is also God's answer to the reality of death. See, not only are you and I experiencing the effects of sin right now in this life, the ultimate and unavoidable future consequence of sin is death. In the end, every single one of us dies. See, Jesus is the only one who's ever died and come back permanently. See, he, he raised people from the dead. Some of you are saying, Has, didn't Jesus raise people from the dead? Sure he did. They all died again. Jesus is the only one to be risen from the dead and permanently, never to die again. In the end, we all die. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 57 that Joe read. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, and then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Now that whole passage, 1 Corinthians 15, it's a long one, but if you read it, it's all about the resurrection of Jesus. It's all about the resurrection of the dead. It's all about our new resurrected bodies. That's what the whole passage is about. When Jesus returns, he's saying, you and I will be raised from the dead and put on new resurrected bodies like the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus Christ. In other words, his body, his resurrected body is the prototype. It's the prototype of the kind of bodies that we're gonna have. Bodies that can't get sick, they can't die, they can't suffer. Resurrected bodies. Now, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians about death because there was confusion amongst them about what happened to believers when they die. And here's why. So many of the people, and you actually catch it in Paul's writings, and especially his early letters, the, the ones that commentators believe are like the earliest ones he wrote, Paul himself seems to give every indication that he believes early on in his ministry that Jesus is coming back before he dies. And, the, and most of the Thessalonians believe that. They believe that Jesus was coming back soon. But all of a sudden, some of the believers started to die. And the Thessalonians, because they lived in this Greek culture that was always telling them there was nothing beyond death and whatever, because they were so confused about it, they were saying, what's, hap what's happened to those people? <laughs> Where are they right now? Are they gonna miss out on the resurrection? Are they gonna miss out on the second coming? How's it all gonna work? And Paul wants to make clear for them how this all works. He reminds them of the essence of Christian belief. He reminds them about resurrection, and he says that believers who have died will be raised up again when Jesus returns. But in the meantime, this is his language in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. He says, they have fallen asleep in Jesus. They've fallen asleep. Now, this is a very interesting term, and the picture here really is a, t a term of resting, you know, despite popular opinion, the Bible's actually pretty vague about where it says the dead are right now. Did you know that? Despite popular opinion, the Bible's vague about this. The most it gives us is it says, those who have died in the Lord rest in him. They've fallen asleep in him. The, <laughs> the best picture we really get is when Jesus says to the thief on the cross, says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now notice, he doesn't say today you will be with me in heaven. He deliberately uses a different word. He says paradise. In other words, those who have fallen asleep in the Lord are in some kind of conscious sense of God's presence. 
There's some kind of conscious sense of resting in his presence, but it's not heaven as we've traditionally understood it and defined it. It's not what the Bible's saying, and that's because our whole notion of what heaven is is messed up. And I don't have time to unpack everything there, but I'm going to hit on a couple things as we go. Paul says um, that the trumpet will sound and all the believers will be raised up and clothed with their new resurrected bodies and the believers who are still alive when Jesus returns. Believers who are still alive when Jesus returns will be changed in an instant, he says, when the trumpet sounds and they will be clothed with their new resurrected bodies. So the dead in Christ rise first and then we are changed and put on our new resurrected selves and all through Paul's writings and by the way it's, it's through the other New Testament writings too John talks about it the author of Hebrews talks about it we haven't got to that spot in Hebrews yet they're all saying that those who trust in Christ's death and resurrection the future of those who trust in him is not a disembodied bliss where your soul floats off to a spiritual castle in the sky but a redeemed physical reality a new resurrected body and a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. Death does not win in the end. Friends, if we die and we never come back, if our souls just float off, death is won. That is not what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Resurrection has triumphed over death. Death is a defeated enemy. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in Jesus' victory. So Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the effects of sin. It's God's answer to the reality of death. And lastly, and this is important too to the text, Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the experience or the problem of exile. Now what do I mean by that? The story of the Bible is one long story of our journey home. It's one long story of our journey as human beings home. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, look, they didn't just feel the, the effects of sin's curse. They didn't all of a sudden, you know, they're not all of a sudden prone to sickness and prone to, to death and whatnot. They, they, they lost the garden. They lost their home. And the whole rest of the story of scripture is all about God trying to lead us back home and our struggle to wander and not follow the path back home that he's laying out. At that moment in the garden, Adam and Eve became exiles. And the rest of the story is all about God trying to bring us back home from exile. Friends, we all sense in the deepest part of us that we were made for more than this world offers us. We, we know it. We know that we're made for more than this world offers us. In the deepest parts of our being, we know that we were made for a different world, a better world, that there's something wrong with this world. And the Bible says that is absolutely true. The story of Scripture is a story of how God's bringing us home. And the story, that story, you know, John, the apostle, got a glimpse of it when he had the vision in Revelation 21. And here's what he wrote down. He says, and this is the last passage Joe read, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Did you catch that? God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. When Jesus returns, he does not come to scoop us up back to heaven with himself. He brings our true home down. He brings heaven with him and the new heaven and the new earth, he brings that with him. 
See, he brings the redeemed city. Our future is not disembodied bliss in a spiritual heaven, but a resurrected physical state in a new heaven and a new earth. The two dimensions of God's created reality, heaven and earth, joined together again, perfectly intertwined, his presence filling all things, filling us. Now some of you are saying, what about verse 17, Pastor Mark? What about verse 17? Doesn't it say that we'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air? I am glad you asked about verse 17. See, that's a great thing about when you're the preacher. You get to both ask the questions and answer the questions. I am glad you asked about verse 17 because verse 17 is one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted verses in the entire Bible. This verse has been used time and time again to argue for something called the rapture. I'm sure most of you have heard of that. Now the basic idea of the rapture is this, that God will literally beam the souls of Christians from the earth and take them to heaven in a single moment. Um, it's like Star Trek, actually, you know? Uh, basically, beam me up, Scotty, and, you know, and... Now, and there's many different views of the rapture, like when it will take place and, and its place in the end times and all these things. I'm sure some of you probably read about it. Um, the Left Behind series that was very popular a number of years ago, and they just re redid the movie that um, is Nicolas Cage's in and whatnot. Uh, this is a particular view, and by the way, it's not, a very, it's not a very old view either of how this is all gonna pan out. It's a fairly new view. It's only a couple hundred years old. But here's the point. There is a Greek term in this verse that does not translate well into English, and it's the phrase, meet the Lord in the air. See, you and I here meet the Lord in the air, caught up in the clouds, and we, what's the picture? We immediately think of Jesus coming down from the sky and us all being scooped up and taken away to heaven. I mean, that's, that's how this has often been taught. But here's what the term and phrase refers to. When the Roman emperor would travel through a territory, the people of the city would go out to meet him. That's the Greek term, to go meet. Would go out to meet him and then would parade him back into the city. The people would go out and meet the emperor and parade back into the city and the whole time they were parading, they were celebrating the reign of the emperor. They paraded back with him. The people did not go out to the emperor and then follow him off to Rome. They welcomed him back into the city and celebrated his reign there. So when Paul speaks about believers being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, Here's what he's invoking. He's invoking this image. It's an image of believers who are being raised from the dead, clothed in their new resurrected bodies, and go out to welcome the risen, re the risen resurrected, returning Lord who brings the redeemed city with him. The, diff the one key difference is this. We don't take Jesus back to the city. He brings the city. That's what Revelation 21 is. He brings the redeemed city with him and it comes and it restores everything and it makes, it makes everything new. Friends, do you see how glorious this is? It's not about escaping this world. It's about God completely transforming and redeeming this world and, and, and reigning in a new heaven and a new earth. It's everywhere. And, and what John says in Revelation 21 is an echo of what Isaiah says in, six, in Isaiah 65. It's almost the exact same words. It's God's promise in the Old Testament. This is what he's gonna do. Now some of you are saying, Pastor Mark, how did we get from this understanding of you know, a, a renewed physical creation, and let me be clear about that. Let me cl be clear about something so there's no confusion. What Jesus brings with him is going to purify and redeem and restore everything that's here and make it new. So it's not like Jesus just sets up some kind of a physical political kingdom, okay? It is, it's, it's different. He comes and he establishes his reign over all creation. Heaven and earth are interlocked like they were in the garden in the beginning when God comes and walks freely. That's why the author of Revelation, John, says, 
I, he will be with his people and dwell amongst them. It's a picture of walking in the garden again, except it's not a garden, it's a redeemed city. Anyway, okay, so let's, we're, we're now at, at where the rubber hits the road. What does this mean for death and our response to it? Because there's huge practical implications here. First of all is our response to suffering. Some of you have lived very difficult lives and you've experienced incredible hardship, you've, in, you've in, experienced incredible suffering, you've suffered a lot more than I have, far more than I have. And you felt the painful effects of sin in very extreme, intense ways. Some of it may be the result of your own sin. Some of it may be the results of other people's sins. Some of it may just be the reality of living in a, in a world that's under the curse of sin and is just broken. But one thing is for certain, and that is that your view of death and what comes after death will absolutely determine how you deal with suffering in the present. See, if there's nothing after death, you will be bitter when you suffer because this life's all there is. And whatever's going on in your life is cramping your style. It's keeping you from what you're pursuing and what you, you know, makes you happy. But on the other hand, if heaven is just a consolation prize, at the end of a life that doesn't matter much anyway, you know, that's not much help in the present either. In other words, if all that matters is going to heaven when you die, then this life is just a means to an end. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's just a kind of a flash in the pan and we're back to Gnosticism again. But if God's promise for f- the future is resurrection, then what we do in this life and what we do with this life matters deeply to God. What, how we treat creation matters deeply to him. How we treat our bodies matters, matters deeply to him. The gospel does not say don't worry, one day, you know, you're gonna get a better life in heaven. So just, you know, that's not what the gospel says. You know what the gospel says? The gospel says that every wrong that you have ever committed is going to one day be righted. And every wrong that's ever been committed against you is gonna be righted. And every bit of sadness and suffering in your life is gonna become untrue. And every bit of grief and every tear that you've shed is somehow gonna turn into joy. It's the renewal and redemption of this life. It says that this life matters, but here's the thing, it came at great cost. The reason the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so glorious is because what he achieved through his death, friends, what he achieved through his death is what led to his resurrection. The only way he could end suffering and the only way he could end the um, the curse of sin and reverse its effects was to come and suffer himself. The Bible does not give us a God who stands distant, watching everything go wrong. It gives us a God who comes in and who suffers with us and suffers for us in order to end the suffering, to reverse the suffering, to redeem the suffering. And Jesus doesn't just experience, by the way, some of the effects like you or I do. He experienced the full effects he doesn't just, he's, he doesn't just you know, experience part of the curse. He takes the whole curse on himself on the cross. And because of his suffering on your behalf, one day you and I will not suffer anymore. All, everything we do suffer will somehow be swallowed up in victory. So that's our response to suffering. What about our response to grief? You know, Paul says in verse 13, The Christians don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We don't grieve like, and here's what he's saying. Notice, he doesn't say Christians don't grieve. He says, we don't grieve the same way the rest of the world does. We don't grieve like everyone else does. Christians grieve differently because we know that death is a defeated enemy. We know that death does not have the final say. We know that there is coming a day when even death itself will work backwards. Jesus Christ defeated death by submitting to death. And that means, friends, that God understands your grief and God understands my grief. 
He knows what it's like to lose a son. He knows what that's like. Some of you are saying, yeah, but come on, he was gonna raise him from the dead. You remember Lazarus? Dead, in the tomb, four days, Jesus shows up. Good friend of Jesus. And when Mary comes out and says, Lord, where were you? If you had been here, this never would have happened. And it says, Jesus says, show me where you've laid him. And it says, Jesus wept. Now, we might say, why was he crying? Didn't he know? He knew in a few moments he was gonna reverse everything. He was bringing this guy back from the dead. Why does he cry? Because, you know why? Because he's perfect. And because as the son of God, he will not close his heart even for an instant to the reality of our pain and our grief. He enters in. Nobody understands like death like Jesus. Nobody And in Jesus, we have a God who not only weeps with us in our moments of great loss and heartbreak, but who does something about it. We need to see Jesus' death and we need to see his glorious resurrection as the victory over death. And when death strikes in your life and in my life, we don't glorify it as something that sets the soul free, nor do we sentimentalize it as something that takes our loved ones off to a, a better place and one day we'll just all get together and have a party. Instead, we stand in Jesus Christ's victory over death knowing that our death and the death of every other person who we ever loved will one day be swallowed up in victory. And it ends in a resurrection. And if you're grieving right now, if you're grieving for the loss of a loved one and your grief is crippling you, you need to look at that victorious death of Jesus. And you need to learn how to say with Paul, where, O oh, de- oh, death, is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting. And finally, what about our response to temporariness? Some of you are living as if this life is the only life you're ever gonna have. As if this world is the only world you're ever gonna live in. You manage and spend your money like it's the only riches and wealth you're ever gonna have. You approach your relationship as the, as the only love you'll ever know. You, you look at your kids as the only joy that you're ever gonna have. You're trying to find something in this world that this world cannot ultimately give you. And you know why? It's because this isn't ultimately home. The world as it is now is not home. And we know it's not. But God has prepared a new home and he will bring it with Jesus when he returns. But that too came at tremendous great cost. The only way Jesus could come and save us from exile was by becoming an exile himself. Jesus Christ leaves heaven. He leaves home. He leaves all the riches and the glory of home. And what does he do? He becomes a wanderer. He says, I have no home. I have no place to lay my head. He becomes an alien. He becomes a stranger. He leaves heaven and becomes an exile. Why? He comes here and he's taken outside the city. There's the exile again, outside the city, and he's executed and he dies because Jesus Christ knows that the only way you and I will ever get home is if he comes and experiences the ultimate exile in order to bring us in. It's the only way. And one day, we will live with God in his new redeemed heaven and earth, in our new redeemed resurrected bodies like the body of Jesus. And we will live in that new reality and we will finally be home. In his famous essay, The Weight of Glory, this is what C.S. Lewis says as I close this morning. When he's talking about the future glory He says, for glory means good report with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last.